At age 23, the mother of Christian rap artist Lecrae got married to her abusive boyfriend because she was pregnant. And not surprisingly, with the pressures of marriage and, and, uh, and fatherhood, his abuse only got worse. He was using drugs and drinking heavily, and his temper made for an explosive situation. Lecrae's mother knew that the man she'd married was only one bad trip away from doing permanent harm. And so before Lecrae reached his first birthday, his mom snatched up their son and escaped. Lecrae became a fatherless child before he could even say the word daddy. Other than a few brief encounters with his father, Lecrae would grow up fatherless. Now, his dad could have re-entered his life at any time, could have at least visited, but he chose not to. And so, as a young boy, on lazy Sunday afternoons, Lecrae said his mind would be flooded with painful questions. Where's my dad? Is he thinking of me? If so, why doesn't he find me? Why doesn't he at least call? That wound, left by his father's absence, throbbed constantly like an open sore that refused to scab over. The years rolled on, but the pain never went away. Lecrae said, I mourned my dad's absence and yearned for his presence. Every child wants and needs a father, and mine didn't want anything to do with me. No phone calls, no birthday cards, no arm around the shoulder after a bad day of school. And because I felt like my dad valued drugs more than having a son, I've constantly wrestled with my self-worth and craved the approval of others. I wondered if I was even worthy of love. Today, we're going to continue in our sermon series to the book of Ephesians, And I'm going to be reading just a few verses from that book, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. And again, I just want to encourage you, if you have not read this book yet on your own, please take some time and read through the book of Ephesians. It won't take you long. Maybe even read it uh, with your family. So uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Children. Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Now, it was really just a few weeks ago that we went over the importance of obeying your parents. Remember when we were in the Ten Commandments series, we covered that. And so today, I really just want to focus on the verse uh, that talks about fathers exasperating their children. Verse 4, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Now, I used to think that to exasperate your child meant to just kind of get on their nerves a little bit, annoy them embarrass them until maybe they lashed out a little, you know, like what I do to Lincoln when I tell dad jokes in front of his friends. And by the way, Lincoln, did you hear the gossip about butter? Well, I'm not going to spread it around. And Lincoln, how do you make a tissue dance? You put a little boogie in it. And Lincoln... Why, why did your math book look so sad? Must have a lot of problems. Now, how could this be wrong? This is fun. Isn't it, Lincoln? Because no. I could go all day. I mean, why did the scarecrow win the award? Because he was outstanding in his field. Now... I suppose dad jokes might get on Lincoln's nerves a little bit, but that's not really what it means to exasperate your child. And so today I want to talk to you about what it really means to exasperate, because 
I learned that there are several serious ways in which a father or mother can exasperate their children. So let's just start by looking at the biblical definition of this word exasperate, which means to irritate to a high degree, to provoke, to enrage, to excite or inflame anger. When a child is exasperated, it means that anger and bitterness is being stirred up inside of him. That's why this verse in Ephesians is often compared to Colossians chapter 3, verse 21, which says, Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. Now, we also should understand that most Bible scholars would tell you that this verse applies to fathers and mothers. And like I mentioned, there are numerous ways to exasperate a child. So let's just start with one of the more common ways in which a parent can exasperate or anger his child, and that is by straight-up abuse, physical or verbal. Now, I think almost every parent has his moments that he's not proud of. I heard even about a pastor who finally snapped at his rowdy son. The dad just couldn't take it any longer, finally grabbed him and just shook him until his teeth rattled. His father said, boy, I believe the devil's got a hold of you. And the little boy said, I think you're right. Even some Christian parents sometimes overreact, angrily spanking their child, probably harder than they should. But when a child is hit or slapped or assaulted by words, it will inevitably generate anger because trust has been broken, power has been abused, safety has been compromised, fear has been heightened. And all of these things stir up feelings of hopelessness frustration and anger. Proverbs 14, verse 17 says, a quick-tempered man does foolish things. And Proverbs 22, verse 24 says, do not make friends with a hot-tempered man. Do not associate with one easily angered. But what do you do? What do you do when it's your own father or mother who is easily angered and abusive? What do you do? Years ago, I read the book called A Child Called It, which details what happens to a child's spirit when he is repeatedly abused. David Peltzer wrote this about his abusive childhood. At night, I no longer dreamed, nor did I let my imagination work during the day. The once vibrant escapes of watching myself fly through the clouds in bright blue costumes were now a thing of the past. When I fell asleep, my soul became consumed in a black void. I no longer awoke in the mornings refreshed. I was tired and told myself that I had one less day to live in this world. I shuffled through my chores, dreading every moment of every day. With no dreams, I found that words like hope and faith were only letters randomly put together into something meaningless, words only for fairy tales. So abuse, physical, verbal, sexual, greatly, greatly exasperates a child. Now, at the other extreme from this abusive type parent are parents who fail to ever discipline their children. Instead, they overindulge, they spoil them. And I think we all know at least one parent like this. Their child can do no wrong. They lavish them with gifts rarely ever correct them, defend them, even when they're clearly wrong and enable horrible behavior. I read this week about Amy Winehouse, who was a rising musical star back in the early 2000s. Unfortunately, her father exasperated her with his overindulgence, overindulgence and tolerance of her sinful lifestyle. And in 2011, Amy died after years of drug and alcohol abuse. In his autobiography, Amy's father, Mitch Winehouse, 
makes it clear that his daughter was spoiled even as a child. He paints a picture of a young girl determined to always have her own way, and it seems she got it. And the pattern continued as she entered into adulthood and started to abuse alcohol first. One time, she even got so drunk that she fell, hit her head, had to go to the hospital. After she was released, one of her best friends, along with her manager, met with Mitch Winehouse to talk about Amy's drinking problem. They wanted Amy to go immediately to rehab. But her father had other ideas. He wrote, I was against it. I thought she'd had maybe one too many, and rehab seemed an overreaction. I think she'll be fine. I told everyone that. Which later turned into a line in Amy's song entitled Rehab. She, she sang this. They tried to make me go to rehab, and I said, no, no, no. I ain't got the time if my daddy thinks I'm fine. After reading about Mitch Winehouse, it's clear that he loved his daughter, at least by the world standards. But why did he overindulge her as a child? And why, at the first sign of trouble, didn't he push as hard as the manager did to get her help? Proverbs 23, verse 13, warns us not to withhold discipline from our children. And Proverbs 13, 24, goes even further by saying that if we love our children, we will be careful to discipline them. The message version of Proverbs 13, 24 puts it this way. A refusal to correct is a refusal to love. Love your children by disciplining them. Tough love is a biblical concept. One of the best examples of indulging sinful children is in the book of 1 Samuel, which contains the story of Eli. Now, Eli was clearly a very special man to God, so much so that he was both the high priest and also the judge for the people of Israel for 40 years. There's no record of any, anyone else having both of these titles at the same time. So Eli was, was well-respected. He, uh, he was both a moral and a civil authority over all of the people, and yet, and yet he failed to exercise his authority in his most important role, the father of his own home. And as a result, he raised two sons who had also become priests, but they did not have their dad's character. In fact, in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12, the Bible refers to them as scoundrels. They disgraced and dishonored Eli and God by mishandling the offerings and by sleeping with the women who gathered at the entrance of the tabernacle. They were out of control. But 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 13 says that Eli restrained them not. Another way that Pastor John MacArthur points out that parents provoke their children is by pushing achievement beyond what's reasonable. He said that a child can be so pressured to achieve that he is virtually destroyed. He quickly learns that nothing he does is sufficient to please this type of a parent. No sooner does he accomplish one goal, and then he is, he is challenged to accomplish even something greater, better. Fathers who fantasize their own achievements through the athletic skills of their sons or mothers who fantasize a glamorous career through the lives of their daughters. MacArthur said he once visited a young woman who was confined to a padded cell and was in a state of catatonic shock. She was a Christian, raised in a Christian home, but her mother had ceaselessly pushed her to be the most popular, the most beautiful, the most successful girl in school. She, and she did. She became the head cheerleader, the homecoming queen, later a model. But the pressure to excel became too great, and she had a complete mental collapse. After she was event eventually released from the hospital, she went back to the same demanding environment when again... She found that she could not cope, and so this time she committed suicide. 
She had summed up her frustration when earlier she had told Pastor MacArthur, no matter what I do, it never satisfies my mother. Another way to exasperate your child is to be overly protective or overly strict. You know, some of the most exasperated people I've ever known had these very stringent, kind of smothering parents. I knew a family where fun was pretty much banned. The kids rarely got treats. They were forced to do all these kind of extra academic exercises. And as an outsider looking in, their lives appeared overregulated and miserable. You ever meet a child who was expected to act like an adult? You know, when a child acts silly or childish, that is completely normal. It was Josh McDowell who famously said, rules without relationship leads to rebellion. So don't forget to have some fun with your kids and let them be goofy sometimes. That's what kids do. Theologian J.C. Ryle said, love should be the silver thread that runs through all your conduct. Kindness, gentleness, patience, sympathy, a willingness to enter into childish troubles, a readiness to take part in childish joys. These are the cords by which a child may be most easily led. So yeah. Children need rules and guidance, but they also need space and joy and laughter and to learn to make some decisions and mistakes. They need that. Now, just real quick, here's one more way that parents can exasperate a child, and that's favoritism. We talked about this not too long ago when we went through the story of Joseph, and you probably remember that Joseph's father had made him this coat of many colors and constantly treated him with favor, which enraged his brothers to the point that they literally wanted to kill him. Instead, they sold him into slavery. And I would say that most everybody in this room knows what it feels like to some degree to be the victim of favoritism. And yet, many of us turn around And do that very thing. Play favorites. We got to resist that. It exasperates children. It stirs up anger. It's not good. Okay, so. I started today's message with the story of a Christian rap artist named Lecrae. And how he grew up without a father. His dad left him. And I think nothing exasperates or enrages a child more than being abandoned. In his autobiography, Lecrae said that there are countless kids growing up with this pain and anger that they can't explain or understand. He said, millions of fatherless children in America struggle with this reality, the the loneliness, the missing person in the stands when they finally hit a home run, the pain of watching their mother struggle to bear the burden of a two-person job, the sinking feeling when the sun rises and sets on yet another Father's Day, and of course, the hundreds of aching, unanswered questions that leave them wanting to scream, how come you didn't want me? Lecrae goes on to say that if you could trace my life's biggest struggles back to their origin, most of them would lead to a childhood version of me wrestling with my father's absence. When I was rebelling or having an emotional breakdown, there was a dull, throbbing sense of rejection And you know what I think? I think if we could trace our society's biggest struggles, it would lead to a very similar place. Fatherless homes containing angry kids. One of the biggest lies, one of the biggest lies we've been told is that dads don't matter, they're not necessary, they're a relic of the past. It's estimated that more than 25 million children live apart from their fathers. One out of every three nationally and two out of every three African-American families. Now, many of you know 
the story in the Bible of Abraham and his role as a father to Isaac. You probably remember that God one time tested Abraham by asking him to sacrifice his son's life. And it's made very clear that Abraham loved Isaac. But sometimes we forget that Abraham had another son, a boy named Ishmael. And in case you don't know the story, Abraham and his wife Sarah were having trouble getting pregnant, and even though God promised they would conceive, Sarah decided to take matters into her own hands. She told Abraham to go and sleep with their servant, Hagar, and produce a child through her. Terrible idea. So Hagar got pregnant and had Abraham's firstborn son, Ishmael. And then about 13 years later, Abraham's wife, Sarah, got pregnant, had Isaac, just as God had promised. And in Genesis chapter 21, verse 9, we learn that Sarah became angry when she saw Ishmael mocking Isaac, and she demanded that Abraham get rid of that slave woman and her son. And Abraham did. He abandoned his son. Ishmael would lead an exasperated life. Genesis 16, verse 12 says, that his hand would be against everyone, and everyone's hand would be against him. You know, I almost didn't preach this sermon today. I almost switched topics with everything that's happening in our nation. I wasn't sure if this was timely or applicable. But the more I looked at it, the more I realized it is. It is. You know, there's so much anger. There's so much disrespect you know, you throw in the protests and the looting. And you know, you know what I see? Exasperated children, spoiled, unfavored, abandoned. Now, that does not mean that they're not responsible for their actions. They are. No matter what your upbringing, we all make our own choices and are responsible for our own behavior, Romans 14, verse 12 says that each of us will give an account for, to himself before God. And we should never, ever wallow in self-pity, blaming our faults on our upbringing. Exasperated or not, we are given the freedom to either obey God or to disobey him. We don't have to be victims of our genes or of our environment. You always have the choice to rise above your circumstances, or to sink beneath them. I once heard about twin girls who were interviewed separately and questioned as to why one of them became an alcoholic and the other one became a complete abstainer. The first said, well, you know my mother was an alcoholic. What would you expect? And the second said, well, you know my mother was an alcoholic. What would you expect? We all make choices for good or for evil, wise or unwise. And even those raised under the worst of circumstances can choose God and can choose good. I read recently about a man who was abandoned by his alcoholic father. His mother remarried, but when she died a few years later, the stepfather abandoned him too. Can you imagine that? Abandoned twice. His life was filled with tragedy and pain, and he was exasperated. But this man didn't surrender to anger and bitterness. Instead, he surrendered to God. And now this man, named Jim Daly, is president of Focus on the Family. He could have easily surrendered to victimhood. He could, he could have became an addict just like his father He could have continued the cycle of dysfunction and abandoned his own kids. But instead, Jim Daly surrendered to Jesus. He allowed him to turn a mess into a powerful message. And you have that same choice. Let's stand and pray. Father, I heard somewhere 
that we don't need to be taught new ideas so much as we need to be reminded of old truths. And your timeless truth is that fathers, mothers, and children all need your son, Jesus. He is our living hope and the only hope for our families. And so, Father, if there's someone here this morning who has not accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, I pray that they would do it today, right now. And for all the parents and grandparents who are here, help us. Help us to be more godly for the sake of our kids. Help us to to love our spouses better in front of them, to laugh more with our kids, to listen more, encourage and praise more. Help us to use everyday, ordinary moments to point our kids to you. And we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, we're going to sing. I invite you to um, come and pray during the song. I'd love to talk to you. If if you'd like to talk, I'll be right down front. Um, I'd encourage you to pray for your families. Um, I also want to encourage you to pray for our country. I don't think I need to go much more into that. We all know what's happening. Um, But pray. And not just today. Just commit to pray each day this week for our country. Okay, let's sing.